Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to our virtual cultural exchange between Morocco and Gibraltar. This event is organized jointly by the Gibraltar Morocco Business Association and the Straits of Gibraltar Association, of which Mr. Ibrahim Krikas is president. I am Henry Sacramento, your host this evening. Let me introduce our guests. Ms. Jennifer Rasami Manana assumed the role of Talem's resident director on October the 1st, 2021. United States diplomat for over 20 years. She served as a U.S. Consul General in Casablanca from 2017 to 2020. She retired from the Foreign Service with the rank of Minister Councillor in 2021, having led press, cultural and educational outreach to the U.S. Embassy in Egypt. Previously, she was a cultural attaché in Paris, as well as diplomat in residence and visiting professor at the School of International Affairs at Science Po Paris. During the Arab Spring, she was the State Department's regional Arabic language spokesperson and led engagement with Arabic speaking publics from Oman to Morocco. She also served as as at U.S. embassies in Jordan, Tunisia, Syria, and Togo, as well as in key senior State Department positions in Washington, D.C. Before joining the Foreign Service, she taught English as a foreign language in Madagascar and worked in technology, investment banking, and venture capital in Silicon Valley. A graduate of college of William and Mary, and amongst uh, and other than English, she speaks French and Arabic. Good evening and welcome, Jennifer Rasamimanan. Hi, Henry. It's so nice to be here tonight. What an honor to have you with us as our guest this evening. You have an amazing CV, Jennifer. But where were you born, and what was your schooling like? Well. Um, where I was born is my favorite uh, reception trick. I make people guess, and I'll give them usually three guesses and then let them off the hook. Um, it, it's a game that works um, less well here than it does in most other places because people often guess very quickly. Um, I was born in Madagascar. My father um, was a Fulbright scholar in the United States where he met my mother at university in the States. And after they married, they went back to Madagascar. I was born there, but I only lived there for a couple of years. Um, uh, so I don't have too many memories of that time, although I did go back when I was an adult. Um, in terms of schooling, you know, the U.S. Foreign Service is very different from other um, diplomatic corps in terms of the breadth and the diversity of our background and our training. Um, so I had colleagues in my diplomatic training corps that were former preachers, that were former ballet dancers, that were former wow. university professors and policemen. Um, I was a former investment banker. Um, I, uh, I worked in Silicon Valley um, in an investment, a startup investment bank that specialized in smart startup technology companies and then later in venture capital. Um, but I had always wanted to see the world um, and live a global life. And uh, that's what led me towards the Foreign Service. When did you know what you wanted to do professionally? Well, that's a good question. Um, you know, I, I used to tell people that it was after um, returning to Madagascar as an adult, uh, which it really felt for, like the first time for me since I was a toddler when I left, um, and getting a chance to live internationally like that. But uh, recently, I went home and I looked through some of my yearbooks from when I was in high school. And as you're graduating, they ask you what your big dream is. And I said I wanted to be a foreign service officer. So actually, I guess Yes, I knew from uh, from very early that that's what I wanted, but then I uh, pursued other things. I think the beauty of the American educational system is that um, 
it's quite flexible. And um, you, for example, you can be at university for three years before you have to decide what you want your major to be and what you'd like to do. And even then, after that, you could, in my case, uh, be an anthropology major and become an investment banker. Or uh, in the case of some of my friends who studied engineering and many other things, they could become diplomats. Um, so uh, for me, it was a, it was a, a circuitous route, but one that really built uh, all of the things that I did built and prepared me for a career in diplomacy. I studied anthropology, which really teaches you how to understand cultures, how to go into an unfamiliar situation and, and quickly break it down into patterns and belief systems. And these are things that are extremely important for diplomats to be able to do. Um, how long did it take you to do all that? To, to, to learn all of those things? Yep. Oh, it was, I mean, I'm still learning really. Um, but, uh, you know, I was, I was gonna say every job I've had has brought me something interesting. I worked uh, my way through university as a waitress, for example. And just the other day I was remarking to someone that um, living in a place like I do uh, that has so many stairs, um, my office is three floors up, my house is four floors up, it's up and down and up and down. And I was saying, you know, one of the best lessons I ever learned was as a waitress when I learned to group your, group your errands so that you don't have to walk twice as far. And so I'm even doing that now. So I would say every job, every experience has brought me to where I am today. You have traveled extensively because of your profession. What brought you to Tangier? Ah, well, um, so I had, I had a very, starting my career, I had a very uh, systematic and scientific approach to where I was going to work. Um, and in my first, my first tour, I had, I did a lot of research on the possible jobs that were open. I made a spreadsheet with the pluses and the minuses, and I analyzed, you know, how much money would I make and what would I need to spend it on? And it was all very scientific. In the end, I ended up going to a place that was not on my spreadsheet at all a place I knew nothing about. I couldn't have found it on the map before I went there, Togo. And I absolutely loved it. It was a wonderful experience. And that really taught me to loosen up and um, go, go where the spirit moves you or where the State Department wants to send you. Um, so in joining the State Department and becoming a diplomat, my original dream was to work in Asia and work in South America and work all over the world. In the end, I learned Arabic relatively early in my career. And so I spent much of my time in, in um, in the Arab world. One of my last diplomatic postings was in Casablanca as the Consul General. And I, early in my time there, um, uh, someone said, you know, you need to go up to Tangier. There are lots of American companies there. Uh, there's the Free Zone, there's Tanger Med. There's this really, you know, unusual and unique institution called the American Legation. We'll schedule a work, a work trip for you to go up to Tanger. I said, sure, fine. From the minute I walked into uh, into this building, I fell in love with it. I, there is, as you know, um, and yeah. as anyone who's actually been here knows, there's there's something special here. Um, yeah. You know, you can explain it and you can give examples, but in the end, when you come, you feel it. There's something special in the walls. The weight of the history and the experiences, and 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 the friendships and all of that come together to make a place that that is really quite magic. Um, and uh, I remember remarking to the previous director of the legation, who was also like me, a, a diplomat, um, gee, you know, who'd you have to kill to get this job? And uh, <laughs> what are you going to get out of the way? <laughs> Very inelegant. And he laughed and said, well, you know, if I ever leave, I'll let you know. Don't worry. Fast forward a couple of years later, and, and I was getting ready to move to my next diplomatic posting in Egypt. And, uh, and he shot me a note and he said, OK, you know, I'm, I'm going to be leaving soon. So if you want to apply, it's now or never. Um, and I thought long and hard about it. I loved being a diplomat. I loved representing the United States. I loved traveling the world. Um, but the idea after 22 years of constant travel, of um, being able to uh, settle down and put down roots and, and, and really uh, be profound in, in the life that I was living with the people that I was living with and the things that I was doing was, was very appealing. And so I retired um, and uh, moved to Tangier to the American legation for hopefully a very long time. That was going to be my next question. Is there a time limit or can you just do it indefinitely? 
Um, as long as the the board of directors of, of the NGO that I'm the resident director for wants me, and as long as I want them, I'm here. Um, for many, many years, I lived my life in the rhythm of two to three years. And literally, my family and I would arrive at a post knowing the month that we would depart. Not necessarily the day, you know, I mean, let's not be too strict. But, but we would literally arrive somewhere yep. in 2017, let's say, and know that in July of 2020, we would be moving someplace else. You wouldn't know where until shortly before, but, but you would know, you know, you would live life in, in two to three year chunks, um, which has its pluses and its minuses. I, mm -hmm. I feel like I have friends all over the world. I've lived in some wonderful and amazing places. Um, but if you get to meet more people than, than the average person, you also get to say goodbye to more people than the average person. Um, and uh, that's not so fun. So it's nice to be someplace that I know I'll be, I and my family will be here for a while. What was your time like in Casablanca? It's a, it's a city that I know extremely well, and I know that it can be chaotic, the traffic is horrendous, the pollution is <laughs> unthinkable. What did you get out of it? I loved it. I loved it. And I will always, there will always be a part of me that's Bedawiya, always. Um, I loved the energy of Casablanca, the, um, the spirit. Uh, it's a beautiful city. If you can look past uh, the aggressive traffic um, and some of the pollution. I mean, I, I moved from Casablanca to Cairo, so I have a, a, a different <laughs> um, measure of what bad yeah. pollution is all about. Yeah. Um, and also what bad traffic is all about, actually. Yeah. Um, but, uh, you know, any place is really about the people that are there. And I, I always felt warmly welcomed uh, by people in Casablanca. And and as though I were participating in the life of a of a really dynamic, uh, diverse city, which was wonderful. Explain the role of the American legation and some of its history. Well, um, as many people I think know, at least here, um, the Morocco is one of the United States' first friends. Um, back in 1777, uh, the Sultan included the United States, the fledgling United States, on a list of countries that he wanted to encourage to come and trade with Morocco using Morocco's ports, and he offered safe passage to American ships. This is really significant because in 1777, we were still arguing over the Constitution, of our, of our new country, this great democratic experience. You know, we were, um, you know, 13 colonies try, try, trying to build a country. Um, but, but Morocco saw something in us, saw potential, saw, saw something and extended its hand. Um, a couple of decades down the line in 1821, Sultan Muli Suleiman, wanting to take these early expressions of, of friendship and, and intentions of building a really strong relationship and, and making them concrete, um, he decided that it would help to uh, give the Americans a place to be, a place to work, a place to live. And so he offered um, the legation building to the United States government. And the legation, legation, by the way, is an old fashioned word for a diplomatic um, a diplomatic mission. Uh, the legation was a diplomatic mission for uh, 140 years. Um, and over the years, its name changed depending on what was happening in Tangier at the time and what Tangier's, you know, what kind of world events were like. Um, it was a legation, it was a consulate, it was a consulate general. Um, in, in the 1960s, the U.S. government built a consulate outside of the old city of, of, of uh, Tangier, which is uh, incredibly beautiful and very atmospheric, but not a super practical place to, to have a government building that has lots of visitors and needs to be secured, et cetera. And um, so once the consulate moved off of the grounds, the U.S. government needed to use the legation for other reasons so that they could they could justify keeping it. So it was for a time a, a language school for U.S. diplomats who were learning to speak Arabic. When I look at the list of some of the great uh, Arabist ambassadors in the U.S. Foreign Service, many of them learned how to speak Arabic in within the walls of the legation. Um, and it was also a training center for American Peace Corps volunteers. Uh, the Peace Corps Morocco 
Corps program is one of the largest. Um, there have been Peace Corps volunteers here since the very beginning of the program in the 1960s. And, um, and because of the strong relations between the two countries, because of the hospitab hospitability of, of, of Morocco and Moroccans, it's always been a very big program with volunteers all over the country. And so for several years, they came here, uh, they were asked to volunteer some, some uh, sweat equity. Um, they, you know, they helped paint walls, they helped tidy things up, and then they learned uh, basic dirigeur, they learned basic amazir and, and customs and everything in preparation to go out and live in their villages and do their projects. Um, in the mid 70s, uh, it, it became clear that the building was beginning to fail. Um, it, it had um, been getting patchwork repairs from Peace Corps volunteers and others, but um, it wasn't in great shape. Um, and a group of concerned friends of the legation came together. There were diplomats, there were professors, there were um, Moroccans who had memories of coming to the legation as young children. There were all different kinds of people who in some way felt moved by the legation, came together and created an NGO, an NGO that today is called Talim. Um, the NGO that employs me. And um, and they did this in just in time for the bicentennial of the United States in 1976. Um, since then, um, the legation has been three things. It's a museum and it and the role evolves every year. We try to think of new ways to reach out, of, you know, new ways to bring more visitors in to sort of tell the story of the legation in U.S. Uh, Moroccan friendship. Um, but we're a museum. Uh, we get between two to three thousand visitors a month. Um, and uh, we have a variety of different uh, rooms and exhibits that, as I said, tell the story of, of U.S.-Moroccan relations and, um, and display a wonderful collection of art that, that has been given to us from, from Moroccan friends, from expatriates, Americans and others who came to Morocco, fell in love, collected things and wanted to share that with, uh, with the world. Um, we're also a cultural center. We uh, regularly organize um, uh, movie nights. We show classic films once a month. We show uh, American independent films. We have uh, musical performances that happen here. We have uh, book readings in many different languages. I think just this month we've organized programs or we will have organized programs in English, French, Arabic, and Spanish. Um, the, the four great languages of the North. Um, we do all kinds of cultural programs. I think the program that I'm most proud of, um, uh, and because it's the one that has most directly touched uh, the most amount of people, is our literacy program. Back in 1999, um, people at the legation and the foundation for um, the preservation of Tangier realized that there were a number of people living in the Medina who hadn't had the chance um, to have a formal education, particularly women. And so we began offering literacy courses and have been doing so every year since then with a tiny pause during COVID. Um, and um, uh, thousands of women have uh, learned how to read and write in Arabic. In addition to the Arabic classes. We offer classes in sewing, in cooking, basic accounting skills, basically helping um, women to acquire the, 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 the skills and the confidence that allow them to participate positively to their family's economical, economical situation. Um, and uh, it's, it's, it's really inspiring. Um, I've had all kinds of interesting experiences in my career, but, but but being able to, to help continue this program is inspiring. Just one, one quick example, and, and I will uh, stop talking for a second. Um, I was talking to a woman recently who, had, who was one of the early, um, uh, early participants in the program. She's been out for 15 years or so. And I said, what, what does the program mean to me, or mean to you? What, what, how did it affect your life to, to learn to read and write in Arabic? And she said, well, I could take my children to the doctor and I could advocate for them. I could help my, my, my young children with their basic homework. Um, she said, and I, um, with encouragement from the legation and some of the skills I learned, I started a business. She said, and now my son and my husband are my employees. <laughs> yeah. 
Wow. That's pretty tangible. That's pretty tangible, concrete effect. And then the third thing that we do um, is that we are a research center. We have a library with over 8,000 um, books, uh, photos, newspapers. We have a lot of very unique things in our archive you can't find anywhere else in a number of different languages, talking about North Africa, the U.S. Moroccan history, all of that. And we have scholars who are come from all over the world uh, to do research in our library. Wow. I, I have to admit, Jennifer, that I have never heard of the American legation until seven years ago when I bought my house in Tangier. And a friend of mine from Gibraltar who was preparing the itinerary uh, for a trip to Morocco to a very young American couple, knowing that I was in Tangier, said, would you look after this couple? Now, there was a list of things they wanted to do. And one of them said, visit the American legation. So I had to very quickly Google and find out about the American legation. And I, and I went and visited it on my own before they came so that I could know what it was about. I can tell you now that any visitor that comes and asks me to show them around, the American legation is a must. It's an amazing building. I think the work you do is absolutely amazing. The courses that you provide, as you rightly said, uh, are, are inspirational. And of course, we are, we are avid followers of the uh, once a month movie uh, that Stephen runs very, very successfully. Um, the courses that you mentioned, is this only for women or are men able to also partake? Only for women. There are other, we feel like there are many opportunities for men and yep. and fewer for women. And since our resources are limited, we had to make a distinction somewhere. And so that's where yep. that's where we totally do it. Totally agree. We have a question that came on screen. There we go. Mm -hmm. uh, warmest welcome to our dear guests and thanks for sharing. And that's on behalf of the Gibraltar Morocco Business Association. Thank you very much. Oh, and we have. Last month, a guest, Daniela Tilbury, saying, truly interesting background and professional experience. Thanks for sharing it with the association. Thank you very much, Daniela, for joining us this evening. Oh, and we have the president, uh, Mr. Brahim Kritas, mm -hmm. that says, on behalf of Gibraltar Morocco Business Association and the Straits of Gibraltar Association, I want to extend a cheerful welcome to our dear guest, Ms. Jennifer Rasamana. Uh, uh, it's, it's a really pleasure to learn from a long diplomat woman experience. My question to our dear guests is how we can empower Moroccan women to do well and why not uh, become a leader and diplomat? There you go. How can we empower Moroccan women? Well, you're um, already doing it uh, in a way with the courses that you're doing. <clears throat> it, I mean, it, it can happen at every level and, and everyone has a role to play. Um, so it's important for employers, for example, um, to make it possible for women to enter the workforce and then to stay in the workforce. Um, Moroccan women do very well at university. They graduate, generally speaking, in higher numbers than men, but they aren't hired at the same levels as men and they tend to leave earlier. Um, because uh, they get married, they have children, life gets complicated. Um, here in Morocco, as in the United States, it's important to look at some of those reasons. Why are women leaving early? Um, what are the barriers to moving from entry-level jobs to mid-level management and senior jobs? Um, so uh, some of it is what's going on at home. It's important that uh, that women get support at home so that they're not carrying 100% the burden of all of the responsibilities at home. Um, it's difficult to try to do 100% at work and 100% at home. So people who wanna help empower women um, need to look around at the women in their lives and see how they can help carry some of their burdens. Um, it's important to think about mentorship as well. Um, many men benefit from mentorship in ways that are both organized and, and, and informal um, and don't necessarily even recognize it. So uh, it's important to try to build networks and structures to mentor women in a very um, 
intentional way so that they can understand the codes of their business culture so that they um, have people to ask for advice so that they have champions when jobs open up, you can say, oh, I, I know a great person in that department or in that company that you should talk to. Um, these are networks that have benefited men in the business world for a very long time um, and that can benefit women as well. Uh, but I think we have to, women need to be very intentional in looking for that mentorship and in building those networks and uh, people who want to support and encourage women need to um, be mentors and create those networks for them. There are a number of great NGOs that work on this issue in um, Casablanca. I worked a lot with a wonderful NGO called Mentor L, M-E-N-T-O-R apostrophe L-E-L-L-E-S. Um, they organize regular meetups and get togethers with uh, inspirational women, with mentees. They put together one on one relationship with uh, women entering the work world with more senior managers through a variety of different uh, programs. They they help to provide some of that support that that helps uh, that can help women succeed in the business world. Thank you for your answer. I think we have another question now. Mohammed. We have a lady, Naiman, from Tangier that says the Medina city of Tangier was su subjected to a major reforms and restoration project, especially during COVID period since 2020, of which the American legation was a part and contributed. How did you find the results and how was the form of the American legation's participation in the project? Thank you in advance. Thanks for the question, Nariman. Um, so I am not the expert on this. I've, I've been at the legation for a year, a year, October 1st, actually. I'm about to celebrate my first anniversary. Um, and we at the, <laughs> Thank you. We at the legation have, have the enormous good fortune um, to have uh, Estimad Bouzian, our deputy director, who has been um, passionate about uh, preservation of Tangier's Medina um, for over 20 years. She was one of the founding members of FTEM, which is one of the big associations working on preservation issues. And so um, in both her role in FTEM and her role at the legation, um, I think she has been very instrumental in, in all of the positive changes in, in, in the Medina. Um, the legation has has over the years hosted lots of conferences on uh, historical preservation, and um, I, I, I hope has been a, res a, a leader in um, thoughtful historical preservation. We have um, a number of buildings in the legation compound. Um, you know, it started with one building and over time we acquired others and turned it into a big compound. And one of the buildings, the Arab Pavilion, uh, was restored over a three year period. Um, uh, with restorers from the State Department's um, Office of Cultural Heritage and um, artisans from Europe and artisans from Morocco. And, and it was a, a, a giant three year long project, but um, I think a wonderful one. And it was one of the early projects to be completed in the Medina that I think uh, was a good, you know, set, set a good tone and set an example for subsequent projects in the Medina. My next question is Jennifer. Uh, who has been the person that has influenced you the most? Who has been your hmm. biggest influencer? Mm, that's a hard one. There have been a lot of maybe, people Maybe there's the been more than one, yeah. Um, well, certainly on a personal level, I, I was uh, very much influenced by my mom, um, who was a small, a small town girl from Ohio. Um, and did this incredibly brave thing of, of uh, getting married to uh, a man with an unpronounceable name uh, in Africa, um, who, I mean, who was from Africa at a time when um, their marriage was barely legal in many states of the United States. Um, and then uh, after college, she just left and moved to Madagascar to be with him and discover what it was like. I mean, it's hard for us, I think, to, to imagine what what, you know, in the 70s, it was like to take such a dramatic move. But um, somewhere in a scrapbook, there's the telegram that uh, that my dad sent to my mom's parents in California when I was born, 
that was how they found out that they had a grandchild, a telegram wow. that, you know, was delivered to their door because it wasn't possible to call. And she talks about uh, sending letters that were six months to get to California, and then the reply would be six months. So sort of a year cycle of conversations um, with her mom. But um, but she set an example of uh, of bravery and, and courage and going out into the world and, and um, trying new and different things and, and being kind. And uh, I think she was very much a, a bellwether for me, a role model. Uh, on a professional level, there have been lots of people, I think, who have um, who have influenced me. Um, lots of strong women leaders that, that I had the good fortune to work under. Um, um, I, I worked early in my career for Colin Powell and uh, General Colin Powell. And when I worked for him, Secretary of State Colin Powell, and he was a legendary leader um, who was very popular and well loved by his troops. And um, he when he came to the State Department after, you know, 40 years of working for the Department of Defense as a military man, um, no one really knew what to expect. And uh, he he brought a dose of humanity and reality to a, a workaholic culture. He um, led by example about how you could work very hard and yet um, value your family life and be kind to people. Um, he, I traveled all around the world with him to all kinds of places and, um, you know, different secretaries of state do things differently. They all have kind of a, uh, a basic, uh, template of what an official visit looks like, the, the, the people they want to see, the things that they want to accomplish. Um, his visits were noteworthy because he always wanted to meet with young people, no matter what what you know huge international crisis was happening no matter what important you know meetings with heads of state you know we we were going to organize we also needed to find time for him to connect with young people um because he said if you know if i don't do it if i don't show that that they're important and they're worth my time who will and conversely if i do do it i'm going to meet someone at some point who's going to you know, be touched, be inspired. And if every time I go somewhere and each time I meet one person who's willing to, to reach a little higher, um, then I'm making a difference. So I thought it was interesting that this man who uh, had had so much power and done so many things over his life still felt like one of his most important missions was to uh, interact with young people around the world. Beautiful. And it's so true. So important. Jennifer, your most embarrassing moment. <laughs> um, um, in my very first diplomatic tour, I um, my job was to be the economic and commercial officer. And um, so my job was to, to foster uh, economic ties and trade between the United States and Togo. And, one of the things I was trying to do was to sell a plane. I was trying to sell a plane to the Togolese military. And that was my, that was my uh, quest for the whole two years I was there. And so I would frequently meet with people from the Air Force and chat with them. And um, uh, every time they, we would get together, they would say, oh, when are you going to come have barbecued rat with us? And I'd laugh <laughs> sort of nervously and say, what do you mean rat? And apparently the high ranking officers in the Air Force had a habit of getting together on Saturdays and they would um, eat barbecued bush rat, which is, you know, not this big, but this big, but it's a rat. It's a giant yeah. rat. Um, or so they told me. Um, and I laughed and deflected until the week before my departure when I... Um, they came to my uh, goodbye party at the ambassador's residence and they said, you never came to headquarters and had rat. You promised that you would, you never did. And I thought, well, you know, I can't, I can't leave this there. I'm going to do, I said, okay, fine. I'm coming on Saturday. So three days before my departure from Togo, from my first diplomatic tour, I pull up to this military base where there are no women allowed but they have left, you know, the general left word at the front gate that, that this woman was going to be allowed on this day. Um, and so I drive in and I and the whole time I'm thinking they don't really eat rats. 
they really, I'm sure they don't. Um, and telling myself it's all a joke, you know, I'm in on the joke, whatever. I keep going, I keep going. Finally, I get there. I get to this big hangar. There are aircraft parked everywhere. And there are these plush sofas kind of set in the middle of the airplane hangar with all of the generals, all of the top brass of the Air Force. And they've all taken bets on whether or not I was actually going to show up. So I show up and they have to, you know, pay each other. Some people lost <laughs> da, da, da. and um, and they say, you know, we know you're busy because you're leaving. So let's get started. And there's a and I look up and this young private comes staggering into the warehouse with this big silver tray laden with a huge mountain of grilled rats. <laughs> And I think, oh my gosh, they're they're real. They really are rats. And um, so they come up to me, and he says, "Okay, he said, the bones are really fine, so you don't have to worry about the bones. Just crunch them." And picks up a rat by its tail, swings it back and forth like this in front of me, and says, um, and eats the head. I don't know that they actually loved it. I still to this day think that all of that was just you know, to tease put me, yeah. put on. And, and I think, and I was sure that they had bet that I wasn't actually going to eat one, right? They had a bet that I would show up. And so I thought I've, I've come this far, I have to do it. And so I um, ate the rat and, um, you know, swallowed each one without vomiting. And then I made up an excuse about how I had to go uh, meet the movers who were coming to pick up my things, jumped in my car, got as far as the front gate of the military base when I had to pull my car to the side of the road, open the door and vomit all over the place. At which point I could see the, 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 the nice guards who were at the military gate, you know, on their phone, on their radios, probably reporting back that, you know, she didn't quite make it. So I think that might have been one of my most embarrassing moments wow. in diplomacy. Although, although I am proud of having, you know, done it. gone through with my commitment. Yes. Absolutely. Well done for you. I think we have another question from Mohammed. Yep. Mohammed from Fez. It's a great pleasure to joining you guys tonight for this much needed cultural exchange. Our dear guests before joining the Foreign Service she was teaching English as a foreign language in Madagascar. She speaks French and Arabic. My question is, based on your experience, what are the differences and similarities between the two African countries, Madagascar and Morocco? Well, um, I have to say that at this point, I know Morocco better than I know Madagascar, believe it or not. Um, I left Madagascar when I was four and um, don't have any memories of that time. And then I um, went back to Madagascar for two years after I finished college. Um, but it's now been uh, 25 years since I've been to Madagascar. So I can't even tell you what the Madagascar today is like. Um, something that I'd like to remedy. I'd love to, to be able to travel there soon. Uh, I was partially waiting till my children were old enough so that they would have memories. Um, it is a pleasure to be here in Morocco uh, coming from my background because it's the first time in my entire life that <clears throat> I haven't had to explain to people where Madagascar is. Moroccans have great fondness for Madagascar because uh, Madagascar hosted uh, Muhammad V when he was eg in exile. Um, right, yes. And uh, they, they, they appreciate that and feel a sense of brotherhood and kinship, I think, as do um, uh, the Malagasy. They also feel very close to the Moroccans for that reason. Um, so I think there is uh, a lot of uh, affection and kindness um, between the two countries. Um, and Madagascar is a country that very much like Morocco, um, it has, is, has been uh, built by people from many different places. Morocco is incredibly diverse. I think that's one of the great strengths of, of Morocco. Um, uh, it's cultural diversity, linguistic, you know, historical, all of those things. And Madagascar as well. Um, one of the nice things about being part Malagasy is people always think I'm from, from here um, because the Malagasy have roots in 
in Africa, in India, in Indonesia, in Europe, in uh, in the Arab world, um, it's on Madagascar. It's on the trade routes. And so, uh, if if a nation had traders, then some of them probably stayed in Madagascar. Thank you very much for that answer. And we have Rola from Gibraltar saying Morocco has started to adopt the English language more and more in the official and private educational systems. How do you see this and how important is the English language in the living sciences? Well, I'm biased, of course, um, but I think that uh, English is the most useful language to learn today. Um, I think that it is necessary to be comfortable um, and competent in English if you are um, studying the hard sciences, uh, life sciences. Um, uh, uh, so much wonderful research is being done in the United States. So many innovations have come from the United States that it is really, um, I think, necessary to be able to access all of that through your language skills, um, which isn't to criticize any other language. I spent a long long time uh, trying to learn Arabic. And I uh, am a Francophile who has also spent a long time trying to uh, perfect my French. Um, but I do think that um, in our time, that English is the most useful language that you could be learning. Thank you very much for your answer. Jennifer, out of all the countries you have loved and worked, your favorite and why? Well, I mean, um, I loved Morocco so much that I uh, retired from a, a thriving career that I could have continued for 15 years so that I could come back and live here. So definitely Morocco is very high on that list. Um, but I have a special fondness for Syria. Um, I uh, lived in Damascus for two years. Um, and my children are half Syrian. And uh, it was... Uh, an amazing experience in many ways. It was my first experience living in the Arab world. So, um, you know, your first time in a place is always very special because you're discovering so many things. Um, one of the reasons I like Morocco so much is because I, when I came here, I found many things that reminded me of Syria that were so dear to me, um, culturally, linguistically, they're two great food cultures. Um, but I feel really uh, grateful to have lived in, in Damascus the time that I did. I was there from, um, 2002 to 2005. Um, uh, I uh, made great friends there. I was so privileged to be able to travel that beautiful country. Um, and so uh, it's the country I think that affected me and influenced me the most in both my professional and personal life. And, and of course, it's the country that I mourn the most because the Syria that I knew um, is gone. Yeah, sadly. That's true. Thank you very much for that answer. Uh, Mohammed, we have one more question, I believe. John D. from Gibraltar. Dear guests, it's no secret that over the past decade, the most popular banking coverage group to join has been technology, which is sometimes its own group and sometimes lumped in lumped in along with the media and tech telecom based in your experience on the field. Can you please tell, let us know how we can move forward and develop this technology on our African country like Morocco and worldwide? Um, <laughs> I think it's true that the technology has been a big driver of, of, um, of development uh, in the United States and through the rest of the world. Um, I think that actually Morocco is uh, on the right path. I've met, a, I've had the chance to meet a number of, of uh, brilliant entrepreneurs here um, in a number of different sectors, particularly technology. Uh, one of my favorite talking points when I was uh, in, in Casablanca as the consul general and, and working to promote trade between the two countries was that, and this is the truth, it remains the truth, there is not a plane in the air that doesn't have a part that was made in Morocco. Wow. Yeah. 
Um, so that is a testament actually to the uh, technological skills that you can find here in Morocco, to um, the, the increasing awareness of, uh, of Morocco's ability to, to produce uh, very sophisticated and technical things. Um, so I think there are a lot of good news stories to tell about uh, technological advancement here. I think um, the area where Morocco can focus its uh, interest Morocco, as in many other places where uh, it is not competitive with the U.S., is in access to capital. Um, uh, you, I grew up in California, in Northern California, which is sort of the heart of, of venture capital. And, um, you know, we used to joke that you can't walk five feet without tripping on a, on a venture capitalist wanting to give you some money away. It's not that easy, but there's very much... Uh, uh, an ecosystem um, for entrepreneurship uh, and and that 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 is still developing here in Morocco. Um, so the the brilliant young entrepreneurs, the technological whizzes, need the money um, and the support and the 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 ecosystem um, to succeed that they might find in the United States or that their their peers have found in the United States. Thank you for your answer. And we have one more question from Mohammed for one of our viewers. And Mona from Agadir. Thank you very much, Mona, for joining us all the way from Agadir. Says, thanks, guys, for this brilliant cultural exchange that brings Morocco and Gibraltar together. We Moroccans extend our thanks and gratitude to the U.S. administration for its support for the territorial integrity of Morocco by recognizing Moroccan sovereignty over the Sahara. We call on the US administration to expedite the economic and cultural investment in the Moroccan Sahara because it is a great opportunity for Morocco and the United States, which will be great benefits. Thank you very much, Mona. Mona, thank you for your thoughts. Um, I. Uh... I hope that my colleagues at the embassy will see that and hear that. I know that that is a, um, uh, a request that is often echoed and that they are very much aware of and, and working on. Um, in my new life uh, at uh, Talim, my focus is very much on, on uh, culture uh, and fostering exchanges up here in the north. Um, and I sometimes can't find enough hours in the day to do that. So <laughs> I'll keep focusing on that. Jennifer, you mentioned that you have children. How do you balance work and family life? Um, I had a mentor in the foreign service who told me that she saw, uh, and she was a, she became an ambassador quite young in her very early forties with two, two children and a husband who also worked in the foreign service. And she uh, likened this to um, a car race, like a Formula One race. She said, if you want to be successful at it, sometimes you put your foot all the way down to the, you know, you put the pedal to the metal, your foot all the way down. Sometimes you take your foot completely off the gas. And you have to know when the right time is to do that. If you, you know, you put your foot all the way down as you're going around a tight turn. That's the end of everything. She said, so you need to be aware that you're not always going to be in the same gear. You shouldn't always be in the same gear. And you need to be flexible about when you downshift and when you upshift. And I think she was talking not just about work, but also about the work family divide. There are times when um, you uh, make family issues your absolute focus. There are times crunch times at work when you really need to stay late, you need to do those things. Um, and then, you know, spend extra time with your family on the weekend. Um, it's not possible to, to do it all. Um, I think people who try to do everything perfectly fail at everything. Um, so uh, it's important to uh, know how to prioritize. It's important to be organized. I'm super organized. Um, it is, I think it's important for women uh, in leadership roles to talk about their families and to be open about the choices that they're making. Uh, I always had a calendar that was uh, 
when I was the consul general and other times I had a calendar that was open and readable by my staff. And I would put things like parent teacher conference, you know, going to see a soccer game, that sort of thing, um, because I wanted them to know all of my priorities, not just all of the work meetings, but also um, the, the kid related stuff. And I also wanted them to be able to do some of those things as well. Um, so again, this goes back to what I was saying about, you know, empowering women and having women be successful. Um, we all need to be thinking about ways in which women can um, respond to the many responsibilities that they have, um, as well as thinking about ways that we can share and shoulder some of those responsibilities. Very sensible. Yes, thank you very much. Jennifer, I have to say, you know, I've seen you at some functions and you wear some of the most amazing dresses I have seen. <laughs> the style is just so unique. Uh, where are they from? Do you have them tailor-made? Tell us about it. I'm intrigued anyway. I had to ask you this. <laughs> so um, these days, most of my uh, wardrobe or the things I feel like putting on um, were all made here in Morocco. Um, okay. I... I, I hope, I believe that it's true that um, Moroccans appreciate it when um, uh, foreign women wear kaftans and jalabas and things. I think generally that they're flattered um, that we would love what they wear and we would adopt it themselves. That's not the case in all countries, um, but I have found it to be the case here. And um, Moroccan fashion is incredible. The, the, the cuts, the fabrics, the workmanship, um, so almost everything that I wear these days, I have a large closet full of stuff, but the things that are coming out on a daily basis are all things that were made here. But do you have them tailor-made specifically for yourself? Because what I've seen you wear is not the sort of thing you can just walk into a bazaar and pick it up. Oh, Henry, yes, you can. You can walk into a uh, into Las Chicas here and buy it off the rack as I okay. did. Okay, right, okay. Yep. Yeah, Las yep. Chicas has some very exclusive things, yep. Yeah. Yep. Fantastic. Jennifer, you know, we could go on and on, but I know you, your, your time is, is limited. Uh, so I have to say thank you very much for having joined us in our cultural exchange. It has been a pleasure to host you tonight, live from the Rock of Gibraltar, bringing our cultures together. And I look forward to seeing you very soon, Jennifer, at the legation. Thank you very much. My great pleasure. Thank you, Good everyone. Bye-bye. Good night and stay safe.